So episode 563, understanding pay to play and some other things. So to understand pay to play, and I got a lot of questions on YouTube and people thrashed me about, which is good. That means I have people actually listening. They were like, give me crap about, you know, I'm the problem and I don't understand what's going on. And, and MLS uh, Next is free and all this stuff. It, they have no concept of pay to play. And I'm going to go over the problems with pay to play, according to me. And then I'm going to actually give my solutions of what we can do to change it. But before we do that, we, we got to understand what's going on with U.S. soccer. So on the U.S. soccer website, and I'll put it in the description uh, below, you got to look at their taxes. They're available. You, you can look at uh, their breakdown. So let's, let's look at um, their breakdowns right now. So here is DA, the uh, Development Academy Scholarships. 962 uh, recipients of a scholarship equaling 791,337. So that was a, that's an expense they got rid of for whatever reason. I mean, they're getting rid of that program. So that's gone, which is not much money as far as trying to capture the youth and, and really develop and change the game. So that's a drop in the bucket amount of, amount of money they actually bring in. So I don't know what's going to be on the next year's taxes with their merger with MLS, uh, their MLS Next. And I wonder if they're transitioning fees over there, which they probably are because they're in cahoots. But if you scroll down, you'll, you'll – um, uh, I'm on page 42 of their um, – basically their – taxes they they had to submit um let me get this so you can see it so here's their spending right here so we got joseph burhalter the older brother of gregory burhalter yeah no nepotism there he gets paid eight hundred sixteen thousand dollars and seven hundred and eighty that's he gets paid that so they have it broken up as his base pay at $483,424 with $296,000 in bonuses. Are you freaking kidding me? Bonuses for what? What's he doing? That's so great. I hired my brother, which saved us money, which I'll explain in, in a second. But you're not going to believe what Joe Ho Burhalter gets paid um, in addition and I'll show you that in a second. We're going to read it. It'll just blow your freaking mind. A couple of them. Dan Flynn, you know, our CEO. We got to have one of those. $930,000. He got $190,000 in bonuses on $667,000 on a base salary. What the freak are we paying these people so much? They're failures. They're absolute failures. They, uh, they get bonuses. What about pay cuts or getting fired for failing repeatedly. Tom King, managing director of admin, $315,000 base, and he got a bonus of $25,000 for what? Because he, he did a, a appropriate administration. Uh, you know, he administered the women's team to win the World Cup. Uh, that's BS. But they, look at these salaries. I mean, legal counsel for Lydia, just Lydia, $436,000. I can take $436,000 and hire Snell and Wellmer and put them on retainer, which is the largest law, law firm in Arizona. I could have them oversee U.S. soccer. I'll get you a team of lawyers, but just Lydia, $436,000. Is, is that... Major I, I, I got to look at the other taxes years prior. Is that just fighting with the women's team? I don't know what it is. Gregory Burhalter, 104000 base salary, $200,000 in bonuses and incentives. He scheduled the most easiest schedule in the world to get apparently these bonuses he needed. But you don't get fined for losing to Canada, you know, for the first time in U.S. men's national team history. So he gets that. So he's total already $313,000 in a year. Um, 
which is awesome. Jill Ellis, $389,000. She's made $418,000. She got $1,000 in bonuses and compensation, and she won the freaking World Cup two times in a row. Yeah. Of course, you know, she's not there any anymore. But uh, Tab Ramos, the U-20 uh, men's national team coach, he's made $489,000. He's the highest paid coach in U.S. soccer. Our U-20s coach. Okay. Uh, David uh, Sakharan. Um, I don't even know. Is, is Sakharan? He, he actually, you know, he was the in-between for Halter and um, the previous national team coach. His bonuses were 1000 Why? Didn't he beat, beat Italy or France? I forgot which one. Was it France? I think it was Italy. Um, you know, in a friendly up there. Uh, yeah, it was France. I think. Anyways, uh, at least he's an indoor guy. Guy played professional indoor for like eight years. Uh, Ernie Stewart, waste of space, three hundred five thousand dollars. I mean, that's a that's a made up position, by the way. I'm mean, like all this stupid spending, and then the, obviously the whole women's teams on here getting paid. But this, um, oh, <laughs> Jurgen Klinsmann, we're still paying this guy off. Why'd we fire him? Why don't we just ride it out? But we're still paying him to do nothing. He gets uh, $1,475,000. That's U.S. soccer. They were duped to hire him, thinking he can change everything, and he couldn't. And we're paying for it big time. One million four hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Here's our. So, this is just setting the foundation of what we're going to talk about with pay to play. This is going to piss you off. This is going to just freaking piss you off. Dan Flynn and Joseph Berhalter health club fees of a hundred and ninety-five dollars per month are covered by U.S. Soccer per their contracts. Are you freaking kidding me? They nearly, I mean, between the two, they're making, just go to it. Dan Flynn is making, made $930,000 last year, and we're paying for his health club. He can't pay for his own health club of $175? It, Dan Flynn, you better be, I, I, I want to see Dan Flynn without his shirt. He better be freaking ripped. 175 bucks a month that we're paying for. Our kids are paying for this guy to lift. He better be freaking strong as an ox. Freaking kidding me. And Burhalter, uh, Joseph, $816,000 he made last year. And we're paying for their freaking uh, health, fitness. And they better be going. Freaking BS. Additionally, Dan Flynn receives personal tax and accounting services in the amount of $34,242 that are covered by U.S. soccer per his contract. What the freak is going This is an insanity. We, hey, we're going to give you uh, a base salary of $700,000 with bonuses. Who knows how far, but you'll make you know anywhere from $800,000 a million. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, can you pay for my, my, my fitness? Like it's one hundred seventy-five bucks a month to go go to a lifetime, on the on the platinum package. Uh, can you pay for that? Yeah, yeah, we can. We we got money coming in all the time. We got a bunch of morons that just keep joining U.S. US soccer. They just give us money. So yeah, sure. Are you kidding me? Oh. Since I'm getting paid so much, it just seems like a lot of work on accounting, and I'm not good with my taxes. Can you guys cover my taxes? I'm like, it's complicated. Sure. No problem. This is ridiculous. So setting the stage of my, the insanity of what goes on in U.S. soccer, and this is a problem when you don't own. This is like, this is government. 
this is government. We keep feeding this monster, and those that are on top, this is like Nancy Pelosi and company. They're just all right. We got a bunch of bunch of suckers. We got the people just giving us money, and we'll just spend it however we want. No one's going to read this stuff. The CEO of U.S. Soccer has established the terms of his his employment with U.S. Soccer by written contract. The this written contract does not include or in any way involve other organizations and is in between the CEO. Um, these guys are idiots. They thought, they thought, hey, we're going to bring in a name like Jurgen Klinsmann and he, because he's so brilliant, he's going to help us win. Let me tell you something. You cannot win without players. We don't have players, and we'll cover that shortly. We just don't have enough players. Oh, don't worry. Uh, uh, we, we have that uh, Yehu from Dallas FC that he's playing in Portugal. Oh, yay. Ridiculous. Um, yeah, so this, you can find all of this on the U.S. Club financial information under governance. Um, it's right there. So we, we have big problems. Here's another problem. So the, here's on page 62 of their documentation here. This shows... Equipment and allotment. I mean, I mean, their equipment, total expenses, three million five hundred thirty-one dollars and two hundred fifty cents, or two hundred fifty dollars. Um, program services, two two point two million. Manage management in general, expenses one point two for equipment and allotment. I mean, I mean, I need this broken up more. They freight everything, by the way. I know that. I know. I talked to some of my friends are uh, within the U.S. national uh, system, and the amount of security we pay for, um, the amount of I mean, they they ship everything there. I think we're, we're one of the few countries to even do that. We ship everything. It's just overkill. And here's the one I, I want to. You show your dues. You got your printing and publications. You got your building uh, reservations. You got all, all this stuff. But the bottom is what gets me. It's the miscellaneous. Miscellaneous. Total expenses, $7.4 million in miscellaneous services. That's insane, is it not? I, I don't know what they do with their spending. It, it's a big mess. So ESPN reported um, not too uh, long ago. The U.S. Soccer Federation is projecting a deficit of nearly $28 million for the 2020 fiscal year, $16.8 million more than planned. The organization announced on Saturday's meeting of the Board of Directors. This is back in uh, early June. June 13th is when this was publicated. USSF Ch C uh, Chief Financial Officer Pinky Reina was among the Federation executives to make the presentation at the meeting. She stated that the results of the fiscal year, which closed on March 31st, are um, preliminary and not fully audited, but the number still present grim financial picture for the USF. Oops, sorry. Um, Got to get this where I can actually read it. Sorry. The USSF have already budgeted a, uh, an $11.1 million shortfall for year 2020, but the numbers that Raina reported stated that the deficit for that period will be $27.9 million. Revenues uh, for the 2020 were $129 million, about $2.6 million below what was budgeted. The bigger impact was in expenses, which came in at $157 million, which was 14.1 more than what was budgeted. I don't know. Could it be that we're paying for a bunch of people to – Go to a, a gym. I need to I need to renegotiate my contract at Phoenix College. I want them to pay for my fitness. It's not going to happen. You know why? I make way too much money, way too much. I can pay for my own. The USSF has attempted to mitigate the financial impact of the coronavirus pandemic in recent month, which has halted program for all of, it, of its national teams. The USSF announced in April that it was laying off furloughs up to uh, up 
to 50 staff. The U.S. is also shuttering seven youth national teams for the rest of the year. Okay. But we're not, we're, we're not going to shave off. It just frees all bonuses for those incompetent fl- fools like Dan Flynn and company, and the Burhalters. They're not furlough Greg. What the, what's he going to do for us? Nothing. They're blaming the pandemic on this. They're, they're doing cuts. I mean, can we, can we stop paying for their gym membership? Can we do that? So this is the beginning tell of the real problems we got here. So let's, let's talk what I believe. So this is MLS and Elite Youth Clubs. This is May 13th. So here's your members by state. I'm from Arizona. You got the Barca, Barca Residency Academy, Phoenix Rising, RSL, Arizona, SC Del Sol. Those are only ones allowed in it because they observe the pay to play um, structure. They have the right licensing, they have all this stuff. Do you not understand that there is teams, clubs that not only compete with these other clubs, but beat them on a routine basis? The Barcelona uh, Academy, first team, the free, the, they got beat by Tuzos in the regional championship a year ago, or it was a year or two years ago, by a coach that doesn't have any licensing, but they have more talent. So that's different. So th- th- I want to cover. What's going on? So there's 94 clubs that are participating in the MLS Elite Player Development whatever platform. And I had someone on YouTube say, it's free. MLS MLS uh, teams are free. Some of them are. Not all of them. And maybe with the new structure they are now. I haven't looked into it, but not all the teams are playing or pay, are free. It, it, but that that's not the point. It's what is being offered to the MLS academies. They're not seeing the best of the best. That's not how it works. All right, so here, here's what's going on. So clubs make money for winning now. And players who dribble, eight-year-olds, seven-year-olds, nine-year-olds, those that dribble and take risk are yelled at whether they're successful or not. That is common practice. Families keep moving club to club because of false promises. So this is number one. This is the pay-to-play structure that people don't pay attention to, and they're like, oh, it's free, so therefore it's it's working. We're doing the same crap, different name. Some some get free, some get scholarships, but the, the whole thought process behind it is the same crap. It's the same kids. It's the same kids being elevated. It's the same player pool to pick from. We don't pay attention to that. But all, all you YouTube morons, comedy, and all that stuff, it, you have no freaking clue what we're doing. We have talent in this country, and we do not identify it, and we, we extract it and move it into something that destroys it. And I've seen it over and over again. Year, uh, I've been watching this crap go down for 30 years. It's like, no joke. This, this is what happens. And until you, like, been a director of coaching or a technical director or build a soccer complex of 24 fields and been through the whole system, played Division One soccer, played professional soccer, watch kids go from point A to point B, going from club soccer to Division One and go through that whole process and argue with parents and for the hours that I've dealt with and the stupidity I've had to deal with over the years, you have no freaking clue. No clue. This is what's going on. One, families keep moving club to club because of false promises and lack of winning. These clubs are have coaches. They recruit through parents or however they try to uh, mitigate the rules. They promise, oh, we have a pathway. We have a pathway to pro. We have this. And they take talented kids 
away from teams. When I'm talking about Hispanic teams, they take these talented Hispanic kids that can just freaking play and they enjoy it. They're in their culture. They're, you know, they're playing beautiful soccer, and then they take their top player and they move them to a white club, and then they can't be them anymore. But their parents keep them there because of false promises, and we're going to do this, and we're going to help pay for these things, and then before they know it, they're bankrupt. Um, two. Mixing cultures of technique. And here's my biggest pet peeve of it, of it all. When you have a team pay to play, okay, and there's nothing wrong with pay to play. It, it, fine. Take your funding. Take the pay to play format. Get the coaches paid. Get all that. But freaking your first team, your first team of every club, every major club, and, I'm a, and I bring this up on how to fix this crap. Every major club, like in Arizona, Del Sol's a major club, right? RSL's a major club. The first freaking team in every age group has to be technical. They have to be able to uh, connect passes. It can't be mixed with uh, kids that are kind of technical. They kind of like the game, but they're athletic, you know, kind of crap. It, it, they ruin the game. Put technical players there. Make sure it's taken care of, and they can pay, sure. But if they can't, you know, that's on you. You, you, can't, you can't put average kids there, ever. And I'll explain how we fix that. But we, have mix, we mix culture of technique. So, you, I mean, I don't like playing with players that just kick the ball. I mean, coaches in, in America have to win because the parents are uh, dictating it, the clubs are dictating it, and people talk and gossip and going on, and you're not playing this kid. You're going to lose your job. There's livelihoods going here, so they're going to try to protect their livelihood or they're not going to be able to function. They're not going to be able to pay their bills. Of course, they're going to try to win. They're going to play tactics to win so they feel good. The parents shut up. That's the way it is. It, it, it's a problem. That's pay to play. So we don't have a player pool. Three, the elimination of competition through segregation. Of You must have a license. must have proper facilities. League after league, these elite. Oh, I play in this league. We're in this league. Oh, you can't be in this league because you don't have uh, seven A licensed coaches in your club. But but we're we're good. You know we we have talented teams. Oh, sorry. Oh, you don't have proper facilities. It's that crap. That's pay to play. Four, too many championships and leagues because of pay to play, and everyone's trying to make a buck on the system. U.S. Soccer hasn't stepped in and created a real national championship, one national title, so everyone has a chance to compete. So we can see. Oh wait, there's a team from. Some we're never heard of that did something. No, we don't have a chance, but we can do it on adult level. We have the U.S. Open Cup. Where's the one for uh, youth? Too many championships, too many national titles, too many leagues, and, and everyone's hiding in their little pockets. We do better than you. Play, compete, fight. Five, shrinking our talent pool by not providing a true national championship, which I just covered. Um Six, bankrupting families over lies and, and uh, deception. That's with, and I say it time and time again, these, they take these his, Hispanic kids, they scholarship them, and then if they want to leave and go back because it's just not a good system for them, they send them a bill. Then they have to stay, pay to play. Seven, state associations oversight on budgets. There's zero oversight on, on their budget. Actually, that, sorry, that, that goes into my fix. So we'll stop it at six. Got this all goofed up. So this is how we fix it. One, reward clubs that develop players. That's number one. So we need to reward them from U.S. soccer. Take some of uh, Dan Flynn's money. It, it, take his uh, membership away, and let's use that and reward clubs that do it right. Give them the money versus just give it to the MLS next or the DA scholarship program. Use money in a different way. Players... Players with money and resources are punished by clubs that don't. So if, if we want everyone competing, have them compete for the dollars. They're all competing for dollars. That's why they try to win every freaking time. Two, provide, provide free coaching education to low economic areas. So I, I'm part of Tuzos, and uh, my family is. My son plays in Tuzos, and it's heavy Hispanic club. I see the coaches. They all think... They know what they're doing, but they don't. They they don't at all. They don't understand. They they work full time and and they you know they have to take care of their 
their job. They're passionate about soccer. They, they, they scream a lot. They give bad information all the time. But time and time again, these kids bail them out because they're, they're from the culture of soccer. They're freaking good. They're good. U.S. soccer needs to use their funding, take from uh, uh, one of the burr halters, and hire three people, full-time people that travel the country and go into these clubs that are successful without the education that's needed because they're not going to pay to try to get an A license. For what? They coach for free. It's just not going to happen. That's a pay-to-play problem that can be fixed. Um, Oh, three. Um, Establish incentives to coaches, recruiters to identify talent. That's on with taking the funding from pay-to-play programs and do experimental inner-city programs. And establish clubs uh, pay for a full-time DOC to teach and identify talent. Establish incentives uh, for coaches or recruiters to identify talent. So if they would use, you know, uh, take out their um, uh, their eating, ha- I didn't even show that on. There's so much wasted spending. I encourage you to go to the uh, U.S. Soccer's web or, yeah, the USSF website and look at their freaking spending. They spent uh, so much crap, 85 pages to go through. Um. So they, they need to they need to reallocate their funding to to do more experimental uh, programs where they t- take full time U.S. soccer uh, uh, staff and go to Phoenix, Arizona, Arizona, go to L.A. and go into the inner cities and organize and help these clubs that need help. They they need to do it, and then they'll identify talent for. Take a risk and stop listening to the same authors of destruction. So uh, we have the same authors that dictate new policy. It's the same freaking people, the same ones that are saying, you know what? We didn't make the last World Cup. I think I have to redo my contract and get uh, my health my, my health club bill taken care of. They, these are same morons that don't care about the state of U.S. soccer. They don't. We need to hire leadership that have the willingness to adopt a new drastic change. We need drastic change. Take a risk. Do something. Five, commercialize and celebrate coaches and clubs that are doing it right. Have have national team players do commercials on the importance of technique. Reward reward the ones that do it right. Time and time again, through licensing, through USSF, talking to all coaches, we're all on the same page. The kids aren't technical enough, and we need to start playing the right way, but we can't do it because the kids aren't technical enough, and I can't lose, and I can't take the risk, and all that stuff. But they know what's right. They should allow the kids to make failures in game and develop that way, but they're not going to do it. They're going to sit them on the bench for even trying, so they'll never improve. We don't have a big enough player pool uh, out there. We, we need more players, regardless of athletic ability, playing the right way so – Everyone's learning and getting better. Six, identify athletic talent talent by seventh grade and create pools as future national team players. Make it special. Make it prestigious. Uh, give those players a pathway for development. If we don't, we'll lose them by high school because most kids drop out of soccer by eighth grade. When they enter high school, they're like, you know what? I got yelled at by coach for I don't know how many times. I'm done. Moving on. I'm going to go try basketball and get yelled at by someone else. We, we can create, put them in a pool. We can identify that. We can identify talent early. Uh, I've used this example way too much, but when kids are, there was a player. Well, I started U4 League way back in the day, and I had 136 uh, two- and three-year-olds playing in this U4 League. And the first team I got, there was this girl on it, Naomi Aguilar. She was a freaking stud, and she was a stud at three years old, scoring goals in. And then from that group, we created a, a team, and then she was scoring four, five, six. I would have to hold her back, um, but she would score a ton every game. Just that's what she did, and she could do it. And it w- it was truly, truly amazing uh, to s- to see what she could do, and. She never changed. She was always a stud. And then as soon as she moved and got integrated to a uh, 
what was it back then? Was it DA back then? I don't remember. Maybe it was DA. Uh, DA, she got surrounded by a bunch of athletes, and she's athletic, uh, but they weren't technical as her. They couldn't combine. They didn't play soccer. They played they played system. Move the ball out wide. Get it down the line to our fast girl. Cross it in. Fight, fight, fight. Go through her. And, of course, she hated the game, quit, and I had to get her back into it. And she eventually went to play at ASU, but she was so messed up from what club did to her. We do that time and time again. We have to get to these kids earlier. Uh, put them in a national team pool early. You, you can identify players by the time they get to seventh grade easily. They're out there. And just put them in the pool and, and change the format of education and deal with those. We need the athletes. We need the good players and the athletes to stay together and get them away from pay to play. Because pay to play will, especially on the, the women's side, they don't teach. They don't. They'll they'll make they'll make an illusion of, of teaching, but when it comes game t- game time, they're not allowed. Very few c- coaches out there will will do do the right thing. All right, seven. Change the rules. So, an example: U six, U twelve from the beginning phase. Yeah. You change the rules, not not the way they did it before where, oh, we're going to make everyone be at half field when we do goal kicks and get it out. Shut up. So stupid. Literally change the point structure. One point for all passes. One point for goals. You don't make goals that significant. Passing matters. Make that U6, U12. And then two points for beating the player 1v1. It's that basic. And then have an intermediate level of that one point for defensive half passes, two points for attacking half passes, meaning anything attacking half, you get two points and one point for goals. And then advance, you can move it up where it, they're actually getting better. One point for passing forward, zero points for passing backwards, 50 points for a goal inside the six-yard box on a one-touch finish on the ground, not a header, just on, you know backdoor pass goal. We need creativity. I've done a point league. I've done it. I'm creative. I'm I'm more intelligent than the the freaking ninety nine percent of U.S. soccer thinkers. They're trying to come up with some uh, way to get our kids to be more technical, and we think it's just like oh, we just need to make more advanced academies. No, no, we 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 have a huge pool and we shrink it. It's so stupid. We need finally. Last point. Um, oh, no, two points. Let's, I'll go on my last one. I have it written. Uh, state associations oversight on budgets. That, that's what I was talking about. I think there should be a thorough audit based on performance. So say Arizona isn't doing well. Like they're not growing and they're not – their ODP program or whatever is just not showcasing the right players and they're no, we're noticing there's an Arizona problem and it shouldn't be an Arizona problem. There should be an audit. And 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 a restructuring of what they do, there should be that kind of oversight. And one audit I would do on Arizona to have them fix is take ODP, which is their number one fundraiser, which is okay. Got to make money, so use that funding instead of hiring more administration. Hire coaches, full time coaches that are willing to go to in the inner city and help de- uh, develop true true all stars. Get an all U8 top players and and create something special and compete and show what Arizona has. We could do that, but, you know, it takes work uh, versus more administration. We're we're always looking for more administration. Last point, going back to seven. That was my eighth one. Seventh, uh, give the power to the people and let them be creative. This can be done. We have so many people, so many uh, smart, intelligent coaches out there but as a collective whole, there's too much administration and too much control of the importance of money and how to afford to pay for things. And I get it. Got to pay for things. That's why U.S. soccer needs to get more involved and give grants and and team up with U.S. Soccer Foundation. By the way, you know they're two separate entities. It's not use, It's just they have the same name. Uh, they had a, uh, a lawsuit over the name uh, last year. Anyways, team up and reward at clubs doing it right. That would be amazing. 
and 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 for being uh in, inventive. Like I had a points league, which made a lot of sense. I had parents, I kid you not, the same parents that would say stupid things, would freaking say, Go backwards. Have you ever, anyone out there in the internet world, have you ever heard of a parent screaming at their kid to kick the ball backwards to their keeper because they got more points for doing so and the score was 120 to 99 at the time because we had flip charts and yes, it was a sweet league. That's, I should have been given money by U.S. Soccer saying, hey, this guy's getting freaking wreck kids passing the ball, connecting passes. That's huge in a real game. Change the system. So, those are just some thoughts. And and I get a lot of you, the haters out there, like, oh, everything we're doing is right, you idiots. Um, you won't listen to anything I just said. Like, it, it just goes right over your head. Just, we we, we got to do something different, right? We keep doing the same thing. We just change the name. Oh, it's free. No, it's not. It's not. Until there's a big awakening with all the clubs. And the thing is, like, we have a lot of paid internationals like English a lot of paid English like that are doing things do you think they give a flying f about America and what they don't care when they go when they go to the sports pub they're wearing the England national team jersey they're not watching the US they don't give a flying crap they care about having a job they love the freedoms of America which seem like they're going away right now with freaking all the nut jobs out there burning everything down um yeah, we, we have a problem. So we got to change the rules, and we have to we have to use the money, the, the Burhalter money, the Flynn money, the uh, freaking postage stamps and all the other crap and all their stupid functions they do and pay for everything. And I'm going to dig deeper into their crap. I cannot believe we pay for their tax services for Burhalter because he can't find his own company to do it. It's ridiculous. Freaking Rick! I mean, you. Everyone should be pissed. I'm mad. So that is it. This is Coach Cameron signing out on this rant that was somewhat coherent, but I did put together. I did accomplish the task at hand, and hopefully, just hopefully, you just educate just a little bit for those ones that oh, we have no problems. There's a reason we don't have Messi's and Marta's out there. We don't. We have system players because the ones that dribble get yelled at by who? The paid coach. Because eventually the dribbler's not going to have success and they're going to screw up and they have to play system so they can win the game versus developing Messi's and freaking Marta's. Uh, yeah, I can go on and all on about all this and I will. Because that's kind of what my podcast is about. Peace out. See you later.